community is all about so I got really uh, <laughs> glad and honored to be here and sharing my thoughts about um, storytelling with you guys and um, transparency so transparency and storytelling equals transparent storytelling and the power of transparent storytelling um, <laughs> Get this thing going. Um, so my name is Peter Smirnakos, as Jasper uh, said. I, I'm the founding editor-in-chief uh, of Icon Magazine and the creative studio Icon Brands, uh, which we started uh, 18 months ago. Icon Magazine was uh, founded five years ago by me and my colleague uh, Joel Pashon. And you know, it's always hard to describe what you do. Uh, I've been working on my elevator pitch for this magazine for five years. I still don't have it, but <laughs> uh, but we try to to give inspiration and insights to to our readers, and we do that by portraying um, game-changing people from from Sweden and around the world, and uh, uh, writing about interesting phenomena. Um, and we do that by, by in-depth journalism uh, that we hope is transparent and try to be really honest. And uh, we always want to take our readers seriously. And so it was founded five years ago. We used to publish it at Bonnet Tidskifte where we pitched the magazine. Um, 18 months ago, we bought it back and we created our own business. Uh, but at that point, we created the, the Icon Brands. Uh, which is a way of adapting this method and this way of storytelling into more commercial side. So we work with uh, companies such as H&M Foundation, IKEA and Fjellreven, um, and uh, we help them to refine and strengthen and build their brands uh, through storytelling. So today I'm going to focus mainly on uh, the magazine part, um, because that's where we started and that's where we kind of formulated our, our vision and our ideas about this. Uh, I'm going to do it through a very simple verge, uh, simple formula, which you probably all, all of you know about. It's the Simon Sinek formula, why, the why, how, and what we do. Um, I think it's a very effective way to, to tell people about, um, about uh, your passion. If you put all these pieces together, hopefully you will get an idea of what we try to achieve with Icon. Um, and perhaps you get a story to share with your relatives uh, during Christmas this year. I hope so. We'll see. Um, so um, why we do this, we do this of course out of a passion for stories, you know, some people like to bake the bread, climb the mountains, write algorithms, or do marketing. I have a passion for stories, I've always, always had a passion for stories. Um, I try to remember when this all started, I don't really know, but I do recall that I went to Greece every summer, my dad is Greek, so on graduation day, from the, from the day that I was seven, Till they was like 14 or 15, my mom and dad waited for me with this fully packed car, and we were going to Greece for two and a half months. I really, really enjoyed being there. I also hated going away from my friends, and I especially hated that car trip because it took five days to drive through Europe. And, you know, this was in 1983. It will take another, you know, 27 years for Steve Jobs to invent the iPad. So. And, and the car didn't even have air conditioning, so it was actually horrible in that backseat. Uh, I used to dream about a portable VCR, but you know, there was no, no escaping the, the, the boredom of that, uh, that backseat. But I brought a lot of books and I brought some notepads and I brought, you know, you remember the, the cassette, the cassette tapes, uh, where I listened to Tintin stories. Uh, I read all the classics, Treasure Island, uh, Lord of the, Rings, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, 
uh, Robinson Crusoe, etc. And I started writing my own stories. I think that I found kind of the passion for the written word in that back seat. Um, so, um, and it's just been with me uh, at all times since, since then. At, and now I, I just, you know, devour all kind of media uh, that I come across. Here's just some examples of uh, inspir you know, inspiring um, storytellers and inspiring stories uh, the last five, ten years. Uh, I don't want to stay too long on this slide, but I just would like to recommend especially this documentary, if you haven't seen it, it's called The Art Artist is Present. Uh, it's about the performance artist Marina Abramovich and her big retrospective at MoMA six years ago. Um, and the final piece for this retrospective was called The Artist is Present, and uh, <clears throat> it was about her sitting in one of the rooms and letting the audience sit across her and just look her in the eye for as long as they wanted. And she sat there for eight, eight hours per day for three months, and it totally changed her life and the life of many of the visitors who came and saw, sat across her. So that one is, is really top-notch. Uh, because I do think that, you know, that stories are a really powerful tool. It's, it's the way that we explain the world we live in, in many senses, and, you know, the stories shape the reality that we see, or that we think that we see. And I do really believe that, you know, the right story told to the right person in the right context can change, you know, lives. It can change the society we live in. Um, and at ICON, we, we, we really believe that, you know, as, as humans, we need to challenge ourselves constantly with new stories and new impressions and new ideas. And um, we really think that meeting new people and, you know, sharing their passions firsthand uh, really is contagious and it can make us, you know, make life-changing decisions. So this might sound pretentious, but, but this is really what we believe that, you know, if we all broaden our horizons a little bit, the world would probably be a better place. Um, and this is how ICON came about, because we didn't really see, um, we didn't really see that much kind of storytelling seven years ago when we started talking about this magazine. Uh, we used to work at a magazine called Café, me and my partner, and then I went and I worked with Rias Travel Magazine. And in 2009, when we started talking about creating an own, uh, our own brand, old media still ruled the game in Sweden. This is very important to remember. This was before Netflix, HBO Nordic, SVT Play, BuzzFeed, Snapchat, you know, you see what I've listed there. As we know them today, you know, the, the, the variety of media was just, it was like this narrow. Uh, and um, we just saw a very stereotypical way of telling stories everywhere we looked. Um, we saw some really, really old rules that were created by this woman who is a commercial genius and I really admire her. Her name is Helen Gurley Brown and she invented Cosmopolitan magazine in the 60s. <clears throat> she was really a game changer at that time, and she broke many, many rules, but she also created some rules about storytelling. It was like, you have to be able to read the headline on a cover of a magazine from six meters distance. You need to promise your readers something. Uh, sex sells, uh, celebrity sells, use the colors red or white. Don't use yellow or green, because they're ugly. Um, use a lot of exclamation marks when you talk, when you write that. So that was like for the magazine business, but you could see kind of the, the general trend everywhere you look, I think. Newspaper, evening papers, TV shows, etc. And those rules were written like 60 years ago. You know, how much has happened in 60 years? So we thought there, there must be room for something else. This is taken to the extreme. This is. This is four, uh, four different uh, issues of Men's Health magazine. But it's the exact same headlines, as you can see. The only thing that has changed is the model. So, you know, six-pack abs is obviously a very selling uh, headline. So, I mean, you can question the, the uniqueness of this, this magazine. Uh, and in Sweden, it wasn't very much, you know... This, uh, <laughs> okay, so, I really, I really love Håkan Hellström. He's one of my favorite Swedish artists. But this is in the year 2010, and the guy was on 16 covers at the same time when he released his album, Two Step from Paradise. This is actually, I, this is true. Uh, it sounds bizarre, but this was the case at this time. This was a media industry that was completely written by agents 
uh, and PR representatives and artists or actors or you know celebrities dictating when they wanted to give an interview and you always got to talk to them like for you know one hour here one hour there if you were lucky or 20 minutes and it was like always trying to sell something um, and we just felt that there must be room to tell some other stories you can't just write about Hawk and Hellstrom 150 times so we started talking about Icon and we came up with this brand and this uh, magazine idea and we pitched it to Bonjes and they thought hey that sounds great let's do it uh, so so we did it and uh, in the fall of 2011 the first issue was released and um, this uh, this is Bob Shea he's a Hollywood producer uh, he started his, his career in the 60s by producing uh, up in the 70s, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And then he went on and he produced like, I don't know how many hundreds of movies, but it was Boogie Nights, Magnolia, Seven, The Wedding Crashers, and finally The Lord of the Rings trilogy. And he founded New Line Cinema, which got him 21 Oscars or something. So this, and he's also married to, to a Swedish woman called Eva, which you can see there. So we thought this is a, this is a really powerful story. We had access to him. Uh, we, kn we knew he wanted to tell his story. And, um, and we went to, to the Hamptons and we spent a couple of days with him there. It became this really beautiful portrait about this Hollywood producer. How he rose to the top, how he lost almost four billion crowns in the first IT crash. Uh, and he came back and you know, so on. Um, and it was, it was just a really, really beautiful story about a person and also the development of Hollywood at the same time. Um, and when we showed this uh, first cover to Bonnich, they were like, so you're going to put an unknown 70-year-old man on the cover? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, that's what it's all about. It's about not being Håkan Hellström or Veronica Madre. It's about giving uh, the readers something else. Because we truly felt that there must be an audience who wants to read some other kind of stories. Um, so so um, that was the first cover. <coughs> I'm going to tell you a little bit, um, some basic components for, in general, and especially for us. Like when you, when you create what's supposed to be a great story, um, you need to have, you don't necessarily need to have all these three, but you definitely have to have two of them. I want to start with access, because without access you get nothing. Without access you get a junket situation with a celebrity talking for 10 minutes. Uh, and you get to ask questions that somebody else has written for you. Um, so that's not access. Access is like doing an agreement with the person that they want to share this, their story, um, spend time with you, being transparent with uh, your life in many senses, and you know, um, just being invited, I think, and having a, a true and honest conversation with them. Um, and not being an extended marketing tool, uh, just being um, doing a, a, an honest interpretation of, of what they're saying and what they're doing. So access is like several hours of interviews, uh, I would say on many, hopefully many different occasions in many different situations. Um, we always do like minimum one or two days with them. Hopefully we get more time, but it can be really, it can be really tough sometimes. Uh, because if you have the access, you got to get the narrative, and you got you, you really got to have narrative if you're going to write a story that's three to five thousand words. Um, you have to know where you start, what's going to happen in the middle, and what, how you're going to end. So you really not, need to know what you want to say and how you want to say it, and of course why you want to say it. Sometimes these days, I think mostly companies they start in the wrong in the wrong end. It's like. Where do we want to say it? We want to say something on Instagram. Okay, so what do you want to say? And why do you want to say it? Oh, I haven't thought about that. Uh, so, you know, just start in the right direction. And, of course, have the narrative. It's like creating a, a story art for a, for a script, for a movie or something. It's the same when you write a story for a magazine. You, you really need to have the narrative. If you get some kind of disclosure, uh, it's great. It's great if it's newsworthy. It might not always be newsworthy, but you know, disclosure can also be like the person sharing stuff that they haven't done before. It might not be newsworthy, but it's really it can be really you know a great story for the readers. So disclosure is is is, is fine if you have. There's all, also a fourth one, which is conflict. So if you have access narrative disclosure and conflict, 
you basically have like the first Edward Snowden interview that Wired did three years ago. Uh, no, but uh, seriously, you, you, uh, more often you have conflict if you're doing investigative journalism, for example. Or, but it's you know it's a great ingredient as well. Um, so for us, we also have uh, the criteria for us to do a story is time, which is the same as access in this case. Uh, it's totally crucial. We also want to be exclusive uh, as much as we can. We, we don't want to be together with 16 other covers, so we want to make sure that we're alone when we do something. And if we're doing a portrait of somebody who's already famous, we, we really need to have a new perspective on that or you know, a new reason to do this story. Uh, I would say it's uh, one of the most important ones is, is really doing a portrait of a real person. Because many of these, uh, these people who are used to, to giving interviews, they put up a persona, like the artist or the actor or the, the business leader or whatever. So you really need, you really need to see the, the real person. And you only do that by spending a lot of time with them. So the layers that they built up are just, you know, crackling. Um, and we always try to add a multi-layer uh, of storytelling, uh, which connects to the transparency as well. You know, like as I said with Bob Shea, it's, it wasn't just a story about him. It was also a story about how Hollywood had, has developed. Um, and I'm going to show you more examples of that. And also always try to be fact-based, you know, and that, that's the, the driving force of the story, the facts. Uh, and not the sensation, because um, that's also very important in order to be transparent with what, why and what you want to say. If you're driven by sensation, you're, you're going to have a, I was about to say corrupted mind, but that's not really true, but you're going to have a more cynical uh, point of view on the story you want to take. So try to stay on the facts and, you know, just go with, it, with that gut feeling. So, okay, enough of the theory. I'm going to give you some examples of, of, of what stories that I re I'm really proud of that we did and that I think serves as great examples of, of uh, this theory and this method. I'm just going to cheers. Okay, so <clears throat> how many of you know who this is? Most of you know, know who this is. Uh, this is uh, Felix PewDiePie Chef uh, Bay. He's the world's biggest YouTuber. At this point, he has over 50 million subscribers to his YouTube channel, uh, where he plays uh, video games. Let, uh, they call them Let's Play Videos. Um, when I first heard about uh, PewDiePie, it was at a Christmas party in 2012 uh, at Bonnier. It was the head of digital at, at that point, Pierre de Bonnier, who has now created Kit.se, which is a great media brand. But Pierre told me, have you heard about this guy? He's called PewDiePie, he's doing some crazy stuff. He's like, he's got like 20 million followers. Nobody knows about him except for the kids and you should really check it out. He's always very intense. And I was like, okay. So, so I, go, I go up and I, I, I check this guy out. Um, I didn't understand anything. I don't know how many of you understood anything when you saw him for the first time, but I think it was, this guy is totally crazy. I don't, it was like, obviously I was 36 years old at the time. I was like, okay. So he's playing video games and he's acting out, and he's talking like this. He's like, okay, so, so what's his problem? Um, <laughs> obviously not the right target group, but you know, hey, 20 million uh, subscribers, he must be doing something right. And at the same time, you know, the, the vloggers and the YouTubers, they were really on the rise, and we could clearly see a, a, a power shift in the media industry. And we were really intrigued and fascinated by that. So, so we talked about it. And then, we decided that we were going to try to reach out to him and we wanted to do this story about him and how the media industry was, was changing and the rise of the YouTubers. So we, um, we started uh, looking for him. This was 2013 and it was like, I referred to Edward Snowden before, but I, you know, this was, it was impossible to find him. Uh, he didn't have any sponsors, he didn't have any contacts, any agents, any PR representatives, anything. He had his channel. We wrote comments on his YouTube channel, but he got like 1,500 comments per day. Uh, I found him on Facebook. For Facebook, I sent him a message, nobody answered. Um, Maria Lindholm, we uh, our, uh, one of our editors, who eventually wrote the fantastic story, got hold of some email address. She sent like hundreds of emails, nobody answered. And after a couple of months, she reached out to his family. So, uh, <laughs> so Johanna Shedra, his mother, answered. And uh, she liked Icon. Uh, she liked our pers perspective on, on, on doing stuff. So um, she agreed to pass on this request of visiting him and doing this, this portrait. She said, well, okay, so uh, 
you know, all the media in the world are trying to reach to him, and he really hasn't decided if he want to do an interview or, or not at all. So, but I'll tell him that you guys are interested and that I think you, you're good, and we'll see what happens. And then it took another couple of months, 10, 15 emails, back and forth with the mother, and then suddenly he popped up, you know, like, hey, this is Felix, I'm ready to go. <laughs> you can come to Brighton if you want uh, and hang out here for a couple of days. So uh, we, sent, uh, we sent Maria and the photographer Victor Flumia down to Brighton. They spent, uh, I think they spent two days with him um, and his girlfriend Marsha, uh, Marsha Pye. She's uh, also at YouTube. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how many sub subscribers she has, but it's way over 10 minutes. She's huge as well. Um, so it became this really great story. We actually got to meet him, and I, 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 I don't, I, I don't gonna read it out loud. But the whole intro of the text is just a really transparent way of describing what I just described to you guys, and why he really doesn't need to do any interviews. You know. Um, and the first question to him in the text is, so why did you decide to do this? And he says, well, a lot of people know many things about PewDiePie. I thought it would be fun if I could tell them a little bit more about Felix. So that really, that made me proud. I think it's, it kind of says something about how his approach to this interview and why he wanted to do it. And, um, and uh, it was really fascinating. So we did a special issue on the new media industry. We did a portrait of him. We did portraits of some other uh, big YouTubers. And uh, we also did about the new media powerhouse. Uh, we did a big story on Kinsa. So it got, became this great package. And um, of course, global media went bananas, uh, which was also great. So this was our epic split. Uh, no, but the Wall Street Journal picked it up immediately, and then uh, The Guardian came after, and Hollywood Reporter, and The Business Insider, and all the gaming sites, and it just you know, it went bananas. We had several hundred thousands of visitors at our website uh, in one day, which is very much for us. Uh, we're mainly a paper-oriented uh, uh, product. Um, and it was, it was just really fun to see the interest in, in him. And he actually, he talked about creating his own network and leaving Maker Studios. And that really, uh, talking about disclosure, that was like the big thing that, that, that in, got very interesting for, for other media. So, um, so that, was, uh, that was PewDiePie. Uh, this is uh, really one of my favorite stories of all time in Icon. Um, I'm gonna start with reading a quote. Alright, impossibilities bore me. My entire life, people have tried to tell me what I'm never going to be able to do. But I realized early on they were wrong. I learned to shut my ears when people made grand pronouncements like, it's going to take three months to walk with these prothesis. And I did it in 20 minutes. So this is, <laughs> so this is Amy Mullins. Um, I first saw her uh, a couple of years ago. She did a TED talk. Uh, it was Amy Mullins and her 12 different pair of legs. And she talked really inspiring about how these, it was so unfair to others that she got to have 12 pair of legs because that way she could become whoever she wanted to be. She talked about this empty space below her knee as a, as a space of creation and exploring her own body. And she really turned many things upside down to me. And I, I, I really thought that this was, this was really, really, you know, she, she, I got really moved by, by this story. Um, when she was one, one year old, she was, she was born with uh, the fibular hemimelia, it's called, her, the condition that she had. Uh, and it's a condition where the lower part of the, the leg doesn't really grow out. So when she was one year old, her parents decided to, to amputate her, her legs. And then for her whole life, she has just been pushing boundaries for what seems to be possible for her. She was always very interested in, in sports and um, this uh, picture is from the trials for the Paralympics in 1996 in Atlanta. Um, and she eventually broke the record for 100 meters and for the long jump. And she's also wearing these uh, carbon fiber sprinting legs uh, that are now standard for over 90% of the Paralympians. Uh, she was the one who came up with the idea and designed those legs with the company from San Diego. And uh, she <laughs> 
she came up with the idea. I was like, okay, so we want to run fast. Why do we keep looking for the human legs when we're creating prostheses? Why don't we look at the fastest animal on the planet, the cheetah? It's like, so when I heard this, like, is she for real? This is so incredibly cool. I can't even imagine. How can you come up with this idea? So, um, so she, she, she's not just an athlete and an inventor. She's also done runway shows for Alexander McQueen. She's done incredible art projects with Matthew Barney. She's done acting. But first and foremost, I think she's an incredible role model for, you know, on the most basic human level, like what can we achieve? How can we turn something that seems to be weakness into our biggest strength and so on? So we immediately felt that uh, Amy Mullins is, she's really uh, worthy doing a great story. I knew it, she was kind of hard to get get through to because she had turned down a lot of magazines, a lot of TV shows. She had done a couple of big stories for Sports Illustrated and Wired and so on. Um, so again, trying to reach her uh, and her website, she only referred to one representative, which was L'Oreal, a beauty company. Um, sometimes they can be, uh, the big companies can be a little bit hard to communicate with. And they were like, no, oh, by contract she does two interviews per year and she won't do Icon in Sweden because you're a really small market and blah, 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 blah. Okay, so that was it. And then we, ha then we found out that she was gonna carry the, the flag for the Paralympic, uh, US Paralympic team in, the, in, in London. So we contacted them directly, uh, the official Par Paralympics uh, US team, and asked if they could pass on this request to her. And she, uh, she, she immediately said yes when she heard that we wanted to do this. Um, so we, we went to New York and we spent two days with her. We did this incredible photo shoot at a studio and she told her life story. And it also became a story about her, about you know, pushing boundaries, um, the, the history of Paralympic sports uh, and so on. And uh, our readers really, really, really uh, responded to this one very well. Uh, and I. I, I still I'm very proud of the, uh, the fact that we got to tell her story to to the Swedish audience. So my last example is this man. He's one of the coolest people on the planet. I think uh, he's called Yvonne Chouinar. He founded the outdoor brand Patagonia. But he's <laughs> he's first and foremost known for being a businessman with actually wanting to be a businessman. It's taken him 50 years to to, to actually take that word in his mouth. Uh, he started climbing in the Yosemite National Park in the 60s and was a true pioneer there. And he started creating uh, his own climbing equipment and that was the seed to how Patagonia was founded. I mean, they are a multi-billion company and you can't just create that by accident. I know that. Uh, I won't be the Patagonia marketing tool, but you know, so I, I know there's more to it. But the, I think that this company has always had the right perspective. I, they make, their main focus has always been about communicating and. Uh, and having focus on the environmental issues, having a sustainable production chain, being transparent about how they're handling their down process. Uh, they were pioneers of, uh, with organic cotton. They, um, they started childcare at their office, like the first company in the US to do that or something. Um, and and uh, I, 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 really, uh, I really get inspired by that and especially him who is now over 75 years old, still surfs every day. Uh, 10 years ago, he wrote his management book that's called Let My People Go Surfing. And it's actually a management book where he launches his philosophy MBA management by absence, which is, which is, which is about hiring the right people, people who are better than you yourself you know, at doing your own job so that you can do some other stuff and don't be anxious about how business are, is going. So we want you in our, we were the first, uh, the first magazine in Sweden to, to, to tell this story and to do a feature on him. Uh, he was very generous with his time, even though he don't even own uh, a mobile phone. He actually has some old kind of phone. <laughs> um, but uh, we had a great network in, in reaching out to him. So this was not just like picking up the phone. Uh, we knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody over there. So we got to spend uh, four days with him in Ventura at his house. That's his house you can see there. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention, they did the Don't Buy This Jacket campaign for Black Friday, which is absolutely great. I don't know if you've heard about it, but a couple of years ago on Black Friday, which is now huge in Sweden as well, 
Patagonia uh, did this uh, advertising campaign with a picture of a jacket and the, uh, and the copy, don't buy this jacket. And they wanted to raise awareness about you know, trying to fix your old clothes instead of constantly buying new stuff. And uh, this year's Black Friday, uh, they created the concept 100% for Earth. Uh, so they gave away all the earnings from their Black Friday sales to a uh, grassroots organization working, working for uh, a better climate. So I think they have their heart in the right place, and I think he's a really inspiring uh, person. Um, okay, uh, so these stories, I'm going to speed it up. Uh, these stories, uh, two years ago, they became an art exhibition when we created the Icon Gallery uh, in, uh, down at Bibliothek Stan. Uh, so the editorial staff uh, picked 25 of our favorite uh, portraits. We framed, framed them, um, printed them in a limited edition of five, and we sold them, and we gave away the, the earnings for charity. So we raised over 100,000 for Doctors Without Borders. Uh, the picture of Yvonne Chouinard uh, sold out first. Um, Amy Mullins sold pretty well as well. Uh, uh, this very cool picture of her that I showed you, that one. Um, and uh, PewDiePie didn't sell at all, so he's at the office. <laughs> Obviously, the gallery uh, audience is not the same as the PewDiePie audience. <laughs> um, and then uh, this fall, we did this one, which is the icon book. Um, so we uh, collected the 20 of our portraits uh, and released this book together with, with uh, the publishing house Volante. Uh, you can check it out here. Uh, I only have two copies, but uh, you're more than welcome to check it out. You can buy it at Ad Libris or uh, Academy of uh, And I just want to, you know, mention this uh, short about Icon Brands and working with brands with this perspective is also it's very interesting and it's uh, it's fascinating and I I, I think it's it's a great way to build brands in a long-term perspective, doing inspiring storytelling. I'm just going to share with you like um, a big project that we did with IKEA. They they contacted us because uh, Ingvar Kampard has gone angry, they told us, and he thought that the company had lost its connection to Sweden and that they had become so big that an ordinary worker somewhere around the world didn't really know about the history of the brand or the connection to Sweden or you know, why IKEA has these certain kind of values. So they had launched this really big internal education program that lasted for around two years. And they came to us and asked us if we could do the centerpiece of this program, which was supposed to be a publication that should illustrate these four value words that they had, um, that they had which was authenticity, um, authentic, open, caring, and innovative. And they were like, so how would you, how would you portray these four words? What, what's your take on this? And we created the, the IKEA Sweden Today uh, publication, which it was 132 pages. And the interesting thing here is that IKEA was only a part of this 19, you know, in the, in the last part, like eight pages. Uh, all the other pages was about like Sweden and how how interesting, uh, what, what what great stuff has come out of Sweden uh, through these kind of four value words. Um, so that was uh, the IKEA, and um, you know, just to, to, to uh, sum things up a little bit, um, what's transparent storytelling? We're here talking about transparency and, and, and storytelling. I've been talking very much about storytelling, but I do really believe that we have a transparent take on storytelling. I think transparency in this case is about having access and not being limited. It's about exclusivity and not, not being overexposed being fact-based and not sensational, um, a real person and not a persona, and add multi-layers of storytelling instead of just being uh, one-dimensional. So why is it more important than ever? Well, Donald Trump got president of the United States, <laughs> and Mark Zuckerberg is the world's most pu uh, powerful publisher without taking responsibility for what's published on his platform. And uh, those are just two examples. I can give you a lot more, but I think the general trend of what we see in storytelling is going more towards being limited, overexposed, sensational, persona-driven, and one-dimensional. Uh, and you know, to me, it's just if we're, if we're going to storytell the world, we better get it right. So that's why I think it's more important than ever. Thank you.